Hello, everybody, and welcome to Turn to Page, Season 4, Book 8 of Twist a Plot, Race into the Past, by Megan Stein and H. William Stein. It's Stein time. Perhaps it's Stein time. It's high time for a Stein time, baby. It's Woo! very true. Uh, also, don't look now, but there is a car that is ripping through the cover of this book. It's not a, it's not a it car on the cover. He's ripping through the page. This is a very like eighties design. Yeah. Like like we're starting to break the barriers. We're starting to get a little postmodern. Here is a car coming out of the cover directly yes. towards you, the reader. Yep, it is it is ripped to the page. It's coming right through a million miles an hour. Oh, it's good. Oh, it's good. Race into the past. I mean, I can only assume yet another time travel, but this time cars. Mm-hmm. Is. That's exactly what I'm thinking. I'm thinking uh, uh, we go really, really fast, and then we go down a, a, the wrong road, and it leads into 1950. Yeah, I think that's about it. Good episode. Thank you for listening. Oh, excellent. Cool. Well, uh, the, the, the <laughs> executive producer. We should, let's have a second podcast alongside it where we just we just assume what the book is. We give it a summary <laughs> in like a minute, and then we just, yeah. Like, just, just, it's called Don't Turn the Page. Yeah, Don't Turn the Page. Yeah, that would have been the <laughs> Just Fools. judge books by its cover. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually, wait. The Book By Its Cover podcast is actually kind of an interesting idea. Like, you mm -hmm. sit down, you look at the cover, and you theory craft the entire book, and you never, but you'll never open it up. I actually think that's a so fun. it's like a book club where you don't read the book, yeah. you just look at the cover because that's all of the book clubs I've ever been to because I yeah. cannot read. Yeah, I just, do not read them. Yeah, it's just a book club for me too. Yeah, I actually <laughs> there's that actually sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, there's some episodes where we basically have done that too, and and then we went we went and read the book too. But like we we basically sure. theory crafted entire entire books in this series before. Oh, absolutely. To the degree that even some of the things we've theory crossed yep. from the very first page, we've ended up bringing back into the narrative afterwards with yeah. slight amendment and modification. And there's been a couple of times where we've come up with something on the title page, the like the cover that we've ended up being dis disappointed because it wasn't real in the mm -hmm. end. I remember that has happened too. So I will only promise myself that I will see a fast car and we will go to the past because yeah. the title is very clear. Yeah. Also, look at this, uh, the, the special thanks kind of page here. The For Lou is, I think it's like, hmm. For Lou, who almost drove it in Indianapolis. And Mike, who would have won if she ever had? Oh, All right. Uh, Are you ready to be bewarned? Am I ever? Beware! Huh. Don't read this book from beginning to end. You're about to take a ride in a race car that is so fast, it will send you backwards on a trip through time. All right, confirmed. Whew, <laughs> that's a load off my mind. And when your head stops spinning, you'll find yourself in a very different kind of race, in a very different time. 1915. There is a whole life waiting for you back there. Perhaps it really is your previous life. In any event, it's filled with danger and intrigue, and you must make the decisions that determine whether or not you will win or lose, live or die. Follow the instructions at the bottom of each page and choose the paths that you want to take and where to go, but be careful, there are hidden dangers at every curve in the road. If you make only the right choices, you can win not only the race, but fame and glory as well. But the wrong choices can lead you to an adventure you'll wish you never had. Now fasten your seatbelt and hold on tight. Here goes! I like the thought of us getting to an end page and just and just going, Raps, I regret reading this. I wish we had <laughs> I wish we didn't read this. Because <laughs> we got this. I would ending. be better off as a person. I wish I forgot everything we just read. Also, what does it mean you'll find yourself in a very different kind of race? Is... Yeah! What's going on? I... Let's find out. Don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. But this is... Uh, which was the book that Megan Stein and H. Williams signed it? They, uh, the best I believe one. it was The Train. Was it? Yeah, maybe. I could be wrong, but I, I believe it was. It was I, I believe their first one for Twister Plot was on the train. I can actually see that formula for trouble. That's what was. That was dog became president. Yes, you're right. You're right. You're right. That, that was just after the train. That one was really good. That was really good. We've high hopes, Megan and H. Page two. Don't ever, ever, ever tell your parents that I let you do this. Okay.
your Uncle Matt says to you as he fashions the crash helmet under your chin. The two of you are sausaged bobsled style into his multi-million dollar custom-built race car, sitting smack out in the middle of the Utah Salt Flats. Wow, what a start to the book. That's some world building in that one sentence. His multi-million dollar custom-built race car. The two of you are sausaged bobsled style into his million dollar custom-built race car sitting smack out in the middle of the Utah Salt Flats. All right. As far as you look in any direction, all you can see is open space, flat, black and white, cracked earth. All right, you're set. Your Uncle Matt asks. You can barely hear your uncle's voice over the roar of the enormous engine. You can barely move because the steering wheel is pinned against your ribs. And you can barely breathe from the combination of the thin Utah air and your racing heart. But it doesn't matter because of this is the moment that you've been begging for. A chance to feel what it's like to break the speed of sound in a car built by your favorite person in the whole world. Without waiting, what... <laughs> <laughs> Screw my parents! I don't like them! <laughs> Without waiting for an answer from you, your uncle gives a signal, and the two mechanics move out of the way. Two mechanics? Okay. And bam! You're up to 100 miles per hour in seconds. The force is unbelievably strong, more than you imagine, and so far, you're only going 248 miles an hour. The world is whipping by you in a gray blur. Go to page three. Is it just good? Oh... My God! Quite literally, the fastest start to any book. Wow! Yes, this this next page. All right. Suddenly, the strangest feeling overcomes you. The feeling that you've been here before, but that's impossible, isn't it? The G-force hits you like a boxing glove, and for a second, you close your eyes and think you feel the car slow down to a crawl. When you open your eyes, and you're not in your Uncle Matt's race car at all, you're sitting next to a man who's wearing a long white coat and an old-fashioned aviator's helmet and goggles. And he's driving a bulky metal race car that looks like an antique. He looks over at you and smiles. I'm going to be the one to win this race, he says. I'll go down in history as the fastest man in the world in 1915. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Thank you for clarifying and expositing as clearly yes. as you did. Thank you, Walking Calendar, who also has very, very low uh, goals. Like, I'm going to go down in history <laughs> as the fastest man in the world in 1915. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do not want to be the fastest man. Now in 1914, they were quite quick. I couldn't beat that. <laughs> could not, could not. And then I poisoned them all, so 1915 is my year. But I will be in jail for 1916. <laughs> so... <laughs> I will be going down for something else in history in 1916. But for 1915, this is my year, Zoom Zoom. Next year, I'll be the guiltiest man in the world in 1916. <laughs> the, the man who poisoned the most race car drivers in 1916. Uh, anyway, 1915, slowly your feeling be begins to make a crazy kind of sense. Another life, another time. You have been here before. But what are you doing here now? If you think it's possible that you had another life in an earlier time, go to page 5. If you don't believe in time travel, and you think that the idea of an earlier life totally impossible, swap this book with someone and go alphabetize the things in your closet. Okay. Uh, I guess let's go for page 5 unless you think you have a good way to make content out of alphabetizing our closets. I can't, and I don't want to open my closet. Yeah, uh, yeah. Th that's where I put all the things that I don't want to keep on my desk. I, it's yeah. fundamentally not organized. My closets just close. I like, what am I gonna, I'm gonna alphabetize my shirts? <laughs> what are you... By How? color, please. Alpha yeah. Uh, no, 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 you have this under P for pink, but it's clearly A for apricot, so this will go at the front. <laughs> yeah. Uh... <laughs> This is probably the hardest lock, though, that I've encountered in uh, any of these yeah, true adventure books. True, of like, I don't believe in time travel yet. I, I can't. I can't. I would not theoretically be able to continue in this book. I can adopt the persona of someone who can. Yeah, let's do it. Let's role play as people who believe in time travel and go to page five. Excellent. Oh, isn't it fun believing in time travel? I love time travel. Who past life. Back to the Future is my favorite documentary. <laughs> the old car bounces you down a dusty, unpaved road at top speed, 90 miles per hour. 
until you arrive at a warehouse that has been converted into a big garage. There are five other vintage 1915 race cars there, parked under a huge banner that says, an old-timey font. 1915 Cross Country Speed Race, official starting line! As soon as you pull up, a man in mechanics coveralls lifts the hood and starts working on the engine. You haven't said a word to the strange driver, but now he turns to you. Jamie, I know you're still mad at me, but I can't take you with me on the race. I gotta take Corny. He helped me build this car, and he knows every nut and bolt in it. Besides that, it's gonna be dangerous. Baron von Furlhofen will stop at nothing to win. Just remember who gave me this. The mechanic says, stamping his left foot, which isn't a real foot, but a wooden one. You listen to your Uncle Max. Uncle Max? Corny? Jamie? Your head is swimming with names you've never heard before, and faces you've never seen. You walk away into the garage. On the wall, there's blueprints of engines and cars and newspaper clippings and photographs showing the young daredevil race driver, Max Blunt, and his mechanic, Cornwallis Corny Hardesty. Uh -huh. Oldest ass name I've ever heard in my life. Should. Max Blunt is the youngest name I've ever heard. <laughs> Like, Reus Galtus Caesus, Caesia, or oh, sounds so much more modern. Yeah. Uh, go to page six. Then your mouth falls open when you see a photograph of you, smiling and sitting in the driver's seat of the old racer. Underneath the photo of you is a recent newspaper article which reads... For the past five weeks, Jamie Blunt has been visiting his uncle and guardian, famous for the racing car driver Max Blunt, who is readying his specially designed race car for his historic cross-country speed race. Each race car will carry a two-man team, a driver, and a mechanic slash navigator, and will follow a specific charter route from Boston to San Francisco. It is estimated that no one can make this grueling journey in less than five weeks, but local hero Max Blunt and his longtime rival, Baron von Verlhoeven, both say that their cars can accomplish the course in just 28 days. Suddenly, you realize that you're not alone in the garage. A tall man in a heavy brown leather coat has been lurking in the corner. He turns to you on his way out with cold eyes that make you shiver, and he says... Keep your mouth shut about what you saw. Something tells you that the man was not supposed to be there, so you go back outside. But before you can ask Uncle Max who he was, Corny launches into a description of other drivers in the race. Go to page 7. Armando Posada. Corny says, pointing to a bright red racing car. Bah, he's just a snake without a rattle. Some people say that he works for Baron von Furlhofen as well, though. A white car is next. And that's Dwayne Haskell. Four men died in the last race he entered. Uh, everyone said it was a coincidence. <laughs> and it was. Whoa, says Corny. But I'm not so sure. Next, he points out a green car with white stripes and a white car with green stripes. Uh, these belong to the McDonald twins, Don and Donald. Their parents couldn't tell them apart, so they gave them the same names to help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're rich. Racing isn't in their blood. Money is. Corny says. Those aren't mechanics riding with them. They're butlers. Uh, and that in the black car, Corny mutters, is Baron von Furlhofen. It's the man in the brown leather coat. Suddenly, a man fires a gun and yells, Gentlemen, start your engines! The race is on, and the drivers run for the cars, everyone except for Uncle Max. Can't leave without me good photograph of Jamie. It's always brought me good luck. Uncle Max says, and he runs back into the garage. Suddenly, the garage explodes. <laughs> if you want to wait to see if your uncle from the past is all right, go to page 10. If you want to jump into the car and try and catch up with a suspicious man in the leather coat, go to page 12. Um, but then it explodes. Well, I mean, he's not going to be any less exploded by the time we go check. Like, he's going to be mad. <laughs> what are we going to do? Lose. Yeah. We, we got to make sure he doesn't explode in vain. That is so true. I do need to... Okay, I'm going to mark that down. I'm going to mark down ignore... Are we ignoring the uncle? Are we? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll I'm, be fine. I'm or dead. I will, but whatever he is, he'll, he'll still be that if we check on him. Yeah. Everyone is shouting and running except for you. You don't know exactly what's happened, but you know who is responsible. You walk directly into Uncle Max's car, pull a lever on the steering column, and then jump down and start turning the engine over with a metal hand crank. What am I doing? You think to yourself. You've never crank started a car before, but it must be something that Jamie Blunt is very familiar with. You jump behind the wheel. Corny runs out of the garage and hops in, too. How's my uncle? You ask, gripping the steering wheel tighter. Only a few broken bones. 
Baron von Furlhofen must be losing his touch. Corny says, looking down at his wooden foot. What happened to your foot, Corny? You ask me that all the time. <laughs> Do really? Corny says. Von Furlhofen tried to bribe me to work for him and I des to design and build for his race car, but I said I liked working for your uncle. Then late one night when I was working in the garage under this car all by myself, the car just came crashing down off of its jack. Everyone said it was a freak accident, but I know that I heard the Baron in the garage just laughing. I'm gonna get him, Comey. Corny, rather. I know things no one else knows. I will say, canonically our character th that w whose body we're inhabiting does ask him all the time. Yeah. That's... Or... Or... or this is just uh, a conduit body. This is a conduit body that time travelers get sucked yeah. into when they go into the past. <laughs> Man. Uh, sometimes I feel like, like I'm a conduit body. Sometimes I'm no there. No kidding. Uh... You say, and your eyes watch the road for the black car in the brown leather coat of the Baron. Go to page 13. Corny directs you to stop in the next town in front of Wade Wilson's garage, huh? No. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> Deadpool? Deadpool? <laughs> now, Jamie, look carefully at the window over there with the four panes of glass. Three of them are real glass. One of them's empty. You gotta throw this wrench through the empty one. It's sort of a good luck tradition. Corny explains. From this long distance, all four panes look alike to you, but you throw the wrench and it sails silently through the empty pane, falling with a clunk on the floor inside the garage. The crowd nearby reacts with happy applause until someone says, Hey, that's the one! That's the kid! That's the one the police want! Whoa, there's gotta be a mistake! You shout, backing up. They grab you and drag you under the light of a gas street lamp and compare you with a poster that says... Wanted for arson. $1,000 reward. Dangerous youth. Burn down school. Use force, if necessary. It's just a mistake! You keep shouting. Just then, a small explosion startles the mob. Corny's gotten the car back to backfire. And in the confusion, you're able to break free, leap into the car, and speed away. If you want to take the route that goes back to the race, go to page 56. If you want to take the quickest way out of town, page 22. We ignored our uncle. I think... The, the the barrel that we are going down is ignoring everything except for the race. Yeah, I, I agree. Set to 56. As you speed through <clears throat> the darkness to get back on the open road, there are just as many people running after your car as there are people jumping out of its path. Corny is examining a copy of the Wanted poster and shaking his head in disbelief. Wanted for arson? A thousand dollar reward? Burn down school? Use forcibness? I didn't know you were like this, Jamie. If I didn't know you were you, I'd think you were this kid. I mean, the drawing looks exactly like you. <laughs> he says. You smile at yourself and think. If only you knew who I really am, Corny. For a second, your mind drifts from the road, and you remember your life in the 1980s. And your Uncle Matt. Years away, and somehow, uh, somehow, not so important now. With your new Uncle Max somewhere between life and death. And you on the trail of the man who did it. Okay. But suddenly, the road curves sharply left, and when you make the turn, you run right smack dab into a four-car roadblock. With all your strength, you yank the steering wheel to the right. Where's the power steering now that you really need it? <clears throat> but a gunshot explodes one of your tires while your car is still on the edge of a dried-up field. In seconds, you're surrounded, I am ill, by men with torches and rifles. Go on to page 57. Put them out of there, boys! A man's voice orders. Corny's out cold. His head hit the windshield when the car went into a spin. You're on your own, and from the looks of this crowd, you're pretty sure you won't have a chance to explain that you're innocent. You've got to act fast. If you want to distract the men by knocking a torch out of someone's hand and starting a fire, arson, go to page 76. If you want to stall for time hoping that Corny will wake up and help you get out of there, go to page 84. You want to see an arsonist? I'll show you an arsonist! <laughs> yeah. Give me a school right now, I'll burn it! <laughs> I'm down. I'm down to arson 76. We're, I mean, it does seem like the uh, the, the race of the routes. Like, it, this is the closest one to getting back on track. Yeah, it's like, that, that's it's definitely the quickest choice. 76. An accused arsonist trying to start a fire? How smart is that? Quick thinking is not as always the same as smart thinking. And this is a case in point. Not only does your act confirm the mob's belief that you are the arsonist, it makes them really angry, especially because you're successful at the arson. 
It quickly engulfs... Well, I had experience running down yeah. that school. <laughs> the fire quickly engulfs a large portion of the field that you're in. The mob begins to shout. Get the firebug! Get the firebug! But you get free, and you run, and you push, and you kick all the way past all the hands grabbing you. The ground shakes under your feet. The mob can't decide whether to chase you or fight the fire. You have only one goal in mind. Race. No. Escape. Find Corny. Finding Corny in the car is impossible. But suddenly, you see your only chance. Someone in the mob has left a horse tied to the bumper of a truck. Over there! Someone shouts. Get the firebug! There isn't a second to lose. You've got to steal the horse and ride off. Wait, do you know how to ride a horse? If you think you should mount a horse from the right side, go to page 8. If you think it's the left side, go to page 11. Oh, no. Uh, I have not ridden a horse in at least one and a half decades. Yep, same. Why would it matter to the horse? <laughs> do they I... have a left and right side? Feel? Do they have a left? <laughs> I. <laughs> Please get on my good side. Um, I don't know why, but I feel like it's left. I, that is more than I feel. Uh, uh, so yes, that'll do it. <clears throat> left is right, or er, uh, correct. You pull yourself easily into the saddle, and the horse gallops away. Jamie Blunt must have been a very good rider because everything feels smooth and natural to you. Is your house? House? Horse? Leaps over burning fences. But the mob is still after you. The ones on foot you can outrun, and you guide the horse along the bumpiest of paths to delay the cars and the trucks. But the ones on horseback could catch up quickly if you make a mistake. You gallop onto an old wooden bridge over a deep ravine, and then rein the horse in. Quickly, you leap out of the saddle. You've seen this trick in a dozen western movies. You slap the horse's rear flank to send it on as a decoy. The mob will chase the horse while you ride, hide in the latticework under the bridge. But the horse does not move. You slap it again. The horse does, still does not move. Then you hear the voice and horse's hooves coming over the hill, headed straight for the covered bridge. They'll be here in seconds. I mean, it, wouldn't it be obvious that there's just not a person on the horse? Yeah, one would assume, right? We haven't really got a, a form on it. Yeah. Um. Jump off or wait, would, do you want to jump off the bridge to the river 600 feet below, make a leap? On page 18, if you want to crawl under the bridge and hide in the lattice work, go to page 21. So I'm trying to reverse engineer. 600 feet, right? So I'm I'm just over six foot. And I'm like six foot three something. And I'm like 1.8 meters. So that means like three foot is around a meter. So this is around 200 meters. Yeah, about. I think you die. I, I don't think you survive that I drop would, into water. I think it's. I think it, it. I think it is supposed to be lethal, and that's if you don't hit a rock and if it's not shallow. Yep. You still die. Uh, I. I. We gotta go to twenty one. It's either that or pancake mode. Yeah. It does sound good. The horse hooves clattering onto the bridge sounds like thunder. Finally, the thunder stops, replaced by men's footsteps on the bridge. Here's the horse. Spread out, boys. We're close. Real close. A voice says, Zeke, you and a couple of boys crawl under the bridge. It's a lot easier to hide under there than it is to jump in that river. Oh, shoot. You don't have much time left. You quickly, you take off your jacket, wrap it around a large, loose board under the bridge. When you hear the men begin to climb down under the bridge, you shout, Don't come near me! And then you push the board as hard as you can. The huge board, wearing your jacket, falls into the water below. Look at that! A uh, voice says, the little fool jumped. Well, oh. says a voice above you. I guess water will put out that little fire bug. Nighttime. Crickets and your heartbeat are all you can hear. You wait for hours to make sure the men have gone, and then you climb back onto the bridge and run for the other side. As you round a bend, you see a campfire crackling in the distance. If you want to go towards it, go to page 33. If you want to run away from it, go to page 52. I mean, that's got to be corny, right? Good old corny. Yeah, there's, there's a real chance. Cornwallis Hedestry or whatever his name was? Cornus Von Cobb. Uh, oh, you think he's a spy, a double agent the entire mm, time for old Von Baronhof? Could be. Uh, mm. I want to go towards it, I think, right? Yeah, I think it's time to make friends. Yeah. A small figure bundled in blankets is crouching around the campfire. Um, could I have some soup? You ask. The pile of blankets moves and a face looks up at you. It's your face on another body. It's the real arsonist. Well, we're both you know, real arsonists. they're looking for you. <laughs> you say. Sounded to me like they were looking for you. The arsonist snaps back. Did you really do it? Did you really set fire to that school? You ask. Yeah. The arsonist says with a smile. I love fires. 
they burn the hate right out of you. I thought you wanted soup. As you bend over the soup pot on the fire, the arsonist throws off the blankets. You see the club in his hand, but not soon enough to duck. You fall, holding your head, wake up the next day. The arsonist is gone, and so are your clothes. You have to wear the arsonist's clothes, but you want to get rid of them as soon as you can. In a small cornfield, you quickly trade clothes with the scarecrow, feeling a little bit safer in your new disguise. You walk in the main roads and even hitchhike. In the fifth place you come to, you chop wood for a blacksmith, and your pay is 50 cents. If you want to use the money to buy food, go to page 42. If you want to use it to telegraph Max, turn to page 92. Where are we going? How do we get back in the race? Yeah, 92 will get us back to the race. Hell yeah. You enter the telegraph office, which is also the newspaper office and the hospital and the barbershop. I want to send a telegram. You say, and you reach into your pocket to get the copy of the message you want to send to Uncle Max. As you do, a nail rips through your hand. Whoop. Let me see your hand, the barber says. That's quite a cut. I'm gonna have to stitch it up for you. Suddenly you get a great idea. Forget the telegram, you say. I want to place an ad in the paper. As fast as you can, you scribble down this message. I, Jamie Blunt, offer a reward for the capture of my missing identical twin. My twin is a known arsonist who has been impersonating me. You'll know me by a deep cut on my right hand. The newspaper prints the ad along with a photo from the wanted poster. A week later, Model T drives into town, sitting next to a driver is the arsonist, tied from head to foot. Uncle Max arrives later to pay the reward and to take you home. You've still got a lot of choices to make about staying in the past and what to tell Uncle Max and how to live a happy life 70 years ago, but those decisions can wait until tomorrow. Tonight, you can sleep peacefully knowing that nobody is chasing you. The end? The hell? Good, good ending, I suppose. Snitch ending unlocked. Yeah, no kidding. But like, it also, for what it's worth, like you could you could just print that, right? Like you don't I have know. To, no one checks that yeah. fact. You can just print like the, oh, the other one's the arsonist, and when they put that in the paper, everyone's like, oh, guess we were wrong. Like, don't act like this is far from reality, reps. <laughs> yeah, fair point. <laughs> There's not a whole lot. What, yeah. what I'm chafing against here is reality. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, well, we won, but do you want to go to 42, just like the last choice? Absolutely. Uh, also, d do any of these take us back to the race? I don't know. <clears throat> but I guess on to food? 42. Mm -hmm. 50 cents doesn't seem like a lot of money to you, but in 1915, it can buy you a two-course dinner. The waiter even brings you a recent newspaper. You're not having a bad time, and it's about time. After all you've been through, you sit there eating your dinner and reading your newspaper. What's a newspaper without wizards of ill? Until one of the headlines makes you jump up in surprise. American team leads cross-country race. The race car driving team of Cornwallis Corny Hardesty and the young Jamie Blunt is nearing the finish line in San Francisco to conclude the cross-country race of 1915. One contestant, the late Baron von Verlhoeven, a German driver, apparently lost his senses when his racer broke down and could not be fixed. He died of self-inflicted wounds. The race may be concluded in record time of 22 days. But that can't be <laughs> Jamie Blunt. What? <gasps> what is... what? What? He... Keep going, buddy. Okay, <laughs> but that can't be Jamie Blunt because you're the Jamie Blunt. At least, you're you are in this life that has to be the arsonist. You're double. You sit down quickly. You've got to get in touch with Uncle Max. He'll help you. Then the second surprise hits you. Two little words will change your life forever. Food poisoning. You and five other restaurant customers are dead within hours. The end. <laughs> Uh, I, I I gotta say I respect it. the the ending that's like something bad happened and then you died immediately like like it's, <laughs> it's in case it was unclear if this was you it was a successful ending you also get food poisoning so bad you die mm -hmm. rip and bozo five other people and five yeah why did they have to die too rip bozos <laughs> um, we all had the same canned turkey. Yeah, yeah. That's a 1950 thing, right? 1950. It sure seems like it. turkey. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was uh, pork bread and in a tin that was off. Tinned bread. Mm, good old tinned bread. Tinned bread. It, it keeps much turkey. better that way, actually. Put yeah. that in the fridge. Oof. Oof. Crispy. 
I I would like to see an ending where we uh, race. <laughs> yeah, let's go to fifty-two. I can't remember what the choice was, but I feel like it'll. I think it's fifty-two is there. not going to the fire. Ah, uh, yes, I think. You follow the riverbank until it meets a railroad track. You hop on a freight car and ride for three cold days and nights. Finally, the train stops in a town that is... The town that is so small, its bank is only robbed by little people. But there is one welcome sight in this town. Its banner that reads... Welcome, cross-country racing drivers! The next day, all the racers roar through town, and Corny almost doesn't see you waving to him at the stop. And you hip, hip, hop, hop in the car. You can hardly believe it's you. Who wins the race? The truth is, no one wins the race. The McDonald's twins' cars break down. They give up, settling for a quick purchase of the half of Arizona for their summer home. <coughs> Armando Posadas and Dwayne Haskell's cars don't make it through the Rocky Mountain snows. The Baron gets lost and makes quite a few enemies among a usually friendly tribe of Native Americans. And you and Corny drive your race car until the patches can't be patched anymore. Corny is not totally discouraged. However, he's heard talk of some kind of crazy 500-mile race in Indianapolis. You smile the best you can, wondering what Corny and Uncle Max will really be doing during the First World War, which is coming faster than a speeding racer. At least you're together for now. The end. What? <laughs> what? Well, I mean, the last ending was like, you got food poisoning and five other people died. This one's like, we're about to have the inaugural world war. Yeah. Yeah. Also, it's, I mean, pretty bold to be like, the first world war is just, at that time, yeah, exactly. it's pretty. If if anyone else tells you like, hey, uh, war is brewing and it seems like everyone in the world is going to be involved and you're like, oh, the first world war? Yeah. They should be deeply suspicious oh. of you. Ah, yes. War number one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> mm. okay War zero, 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 0001. What? Why do you need <laughs> yeah. four digits? <laughs> oh. Um, okay. Should we go back even further? I think so. We clearly can't uh, race. Yeah, page 18 is our At last. At least one of these has to be as successful. We complete the race. We did it. Page 18 We're... is jumping off the bridge. Should we do that? You know what? Just because it's quick, let's do it. Yeah. Obviously, you've never seen Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. You got me. See, Butch and Sundance are ready to jump off the edge of a cliff into a river because someone wants to kill them. But Sundance won't jump. And finally, he says to Butch, I can't swim. To which Butch Cassidy replies, Swim? The fall will probably kill you. What a mistake. The fall did kill you. You ought to see more movies. Really, you should. Too bad. The end. Uh, of course, maybe you did see Butch Cassidy. This is in the sub, like, on the bottom. We never see this after the end page, but... Of course, maybe you did see Butch Cassidy and decided to jump because of the movie, and they jumped and survived. Okay, you can be alive again. Go start the story over. Bye-bye. Okay. I guess we have to. Yeah, th they hit you with a... Don't at me. <laughs> 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 we know what happened in the film. Don't at me about Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, okay? Do not at me. All right, back to page Help. eight. Eight. So this is eight over 11. Instead of choosing to go to the left side of the horse, we're going to the right side of the horse? I suppose so, that which we do know is the incorrect side. <laughs> Unless you, I mean, die right at this point. Let's just do it. Uh, right? Wrong. Before you can climb onto the horse's back, it bucks you off with a click, quick flip of its arched back. You hit the ground with a thump and the horse towers over you, standing on its back legs and kicking at you with its front hooves. You roll to one side and the other to avoid the hooves, which fall like lead weights. It's almost a relief to you when strong, harsh hands grab you away from the horse, and the mob has you in its clutches again. The fire's out of control! Let's get out of here! Panicked voices cry. They tie your hands with ropes and drag you to jail. Angry mobs don't give you a choice. Go directly to page 28. Do not pass go. Do not collect. $200. Uh, 28 or 26? 20, uh, oh. Really? Or 26. It's, it's 26. Yes. Only because 28 would make no sense. Like, <laughs> True. the mob give you a pop quiz. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wise guy. Which one of these is the clutch? Hey. <laughs> All right. They throw you literally into a cell. 
You land on the bed, a wide wooden bench, with a rat-eaten blanket on it. Welcome to the pit, a voice says. Once your eyes adjust to the blackness, you see a man is looking at you from the adjoining cell. My name is Howard123 Cooper. I'm a bank robber. You've probably heard of me. No. Howard123 Cooper uh, from Xbox Live? No, you answer. It said that I had to have alphanumeric <laughs> characters in my handle. So I came up with one, two, three. No, I've not heard of you. You answer. No? Were you born yesterday? No, actually seven years from now. You say? Uh, not funny, kid. Now, listen, I've robbed every bank worth robbing east of the Cleveland, Ohio, at least once. With me, robbing a bank is as easy as one, two, three. That's the other reason how I got that nickname. Uh, what did you do? Nothing. You say? <sighs> yeah, I believe that. And you think this is a hotel, right? I believe that too. Howard Cooper says with a laugh. I'm checking out at this hotel today, and if you help me, kid, I'll take you with me. Here's the plan. I'm gonna pretend I'm sick, and you call the guard. The rest is up to me. Think about it, kid. Take your time. One, two, time's up. Are you gonna help me escape? If you want to try this escape plan, turn to page 32. If you don't want to be responsible for letting a dangerous bank robber loose, go to page 36. What do I care? <laughs> Not my bank. Not my bank. <clears throat> God! God! You shout at the top of your voice. The guy in the next cell is sick. He's really sick. He's lying on the floor. The guard carrying a kerosene lantern walks slowly down the rows of cells. Rats scatter from the light. He holds the light in front of the Howard, the Howard Cooper's cell. Cooper is lying on the floor motionless. The guard unlocks the cell and walks over to him. Cooper doesn't move. When the guard puts the lantern on the floor and leans over Howard Cooper, the struggle begins. It doesn't last very long. In seconds, the guard is lying on the floor motionless. You do good work, kid. Howard Cooper's saying as he pockets the guard's pistol. I didn't think you were going to hurt him. You say in the light of the lantern, you can see the guard's head is bleeding. Well, life is full of surprises, kid. And here's another one just for you. I'm leaving and you're staying. Howard Cooper says. We had a deal. You say. Only one of us believed that, kid. Look me up when you're about 20 years smarter. So long, kid. Howard Cooper says, and then disappears into the darkness. If you want to call for help for the bleeding unconscious guard, go to 46. If you want to reach through the bars and try and grab the keys on the floor, turn to page 80. Mm. I don't think the guard will be particularly forgiving. Yeah. Yeah, let's go for 80. We gotta get out to help him. As you stretch your arm through the bars of your cell, the guard lifts his head and moans. You decide that it'll probably be okay. He'll be fine. So you take the keys and you run. You run right into Corny. Go on without me. You tell Corny. If I stay with you, we'll always be turning back roads and looking over our shoulders. If you go alone, you've got a chance of beating the Baron. For Max. Corny finally agrees. <laughs> After much, much dispute, he drives off. And you walk up the road to a nearby farmhouse. That's close enough. This is a man holding a shotgun. I didn't think you'd show your face around here ever again. I don't care if you're my only one and child. <laughs> you are not welcome here. I'm not who you think I am. You say, and the arsonist's father can see immediately that you're telling the truth. He hides and protects you for the next two years. In the meantime, you read in the paper that Corny did win the race, and Uncle Max hey! was well enough to take the train to San Francisco to accept the part of the prize. Finally, the real arsonist is then caught, and you're free to go, although... You really like the old man who's been hiding you. You can't resist going back to Max and Corny and the exciting life of racing that you were obviously meant to lead. The end. Huh. Is it pretty? I, I guess in this good. version of events, Corny at least does make it over the line. This is the most, this is the most good ending. Uh, and it's, it's certainly the best that we've encountered close. so far. We also get a loving, like, like yeah. parental figure. Clearly he gets a we new were, son like, that's not an arsonist. <laughs> Kind of. <laughs> like, we weren't doing so well before. Our Uncle Matt was our favorite person in the world, and we've not once gone like, oh, what about my parents and my sister? Like, there is no one other than Uncle Matt that we care about back at home. And now we've inherited another parental figure. Like, I, we upgraded. this is a lateral trade. Yeah, absolutely upgraded. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this guy's really got a type for, for sons. Uh, just arsonist types. <laughs> like. <laughs> you, you really got a 
type of songs, man. All of them look like you. <laughs> All of them look like you. Come on, try something new. They all, look, they all look like you. They all act like you. They all live with you. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> <laughs> they all are. Why not have a son that you've never met on a different side of the globe? Yeah. Someone that you never interact with in any way, shape, and or form who doesn't know that they are your son. You know, that'd be a real bold choice. Yeah. Like, like me and my parents, whatever their names are. <laughs> who I presume are out there. Yeah. Uh, do you want to try for one more on 46 here? I'll do it. Sure. What's 46 choice? Uh, that's a great question. It is the last one. Uh, calling for the, the, uh, guard. The, yes, is that it? The, the guard bleeding out. Let's see how this goes. So you did the right thing. So where did it get you? The townspeople hold the shortest trial in history in the morning and plan to hang you from the longest rope in the afternoon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let him bleed out, I guess. That afternoon, the sun is shining, skies are translucent blue, and birds are singing. It's not exactly the kind of day you expected for your own hanging. The thick rope hugs your neck like a tight turtleneck sweater. Okay. The mayor gives a long speech, then turns to you and says, Well... Do you have any last words? You look around the town for a second, and then you shout, Look! Fire! The crowd turns to see a black smoke billowing out of the town hall building. And there he goes! You shout, pointing at the short figure running at top speed. That's the real arsonist! The crowd scatters. Minutes later, three strong men drag the young arsonist who looks just like you off to jail. The people of the town ask if there's anything they could possibly do to make it up for the terrible mistake they made. You say yes. You've always wanted a permanent place in history. You'd like it if they would rename their town after you. They refuse. The end. That's so good! <laughs> I love it! <sighs> no. <laughs> So many of the endings under uh, Megan and H. William Stein are written like a joke, like written like as as a subversion punchline, yeah. and they're always very, very like succinct in the delivery of the final I love bit. But it. this is as close as you can get to that. That is such <laughs> a good. They ask if end. you'd want a reward. You ask for a specific reward. No end. <laughs> <laughs> no. Also, uh, surely it would be named after Jamie, not actually us. That is but also true. I guess we get true. to live as Jamie for the rest of the time. Yeah, they're very, very true. Uh, well, I gotta say, we did have the race won. We weren't necessarily in the car at the time, but Corny took it along the line and Max got the prize. We've got to feel good about that. Entirely true. Uh, I will say, just because I can tell it's not going to be too much <laughs> more... Sure. Can we go 36, not help the, the criminal, and run that Absolutely. one to, run that one to the end, and then we'll call it after that. There's no way you'll help a low life like Howard Cooper. That's okay, kid. I can handle it myself. But don't you ever say, oh, one, two, three, never offered you nothing. Howard Cooper says to you. He lies down on the floor of his cell and begins to call for the guard. Oh, God! Hey, God! Help! What's your other record in here? A gruff voice calls through the darkness. Guard, one of these rats bit me. I'm, I'm sick. I'm really sick. Howard Cooper moans. Just a minute, I'm coming. The guard calls back. All right, what's all this complaining? Before Cooper can say anything else, you yell. Don't oh. believe him. It's a trick. He's just trying to escape from the jail. The guard looks at you hard. I know that. The guard says. But we have to make this look real, don't we? Now. One more word out of you, kid, and I'll muzzle you for good. The guard unlocks Howard Cooper's cell. He gives Howard his police revolver and says, Okay, make it look like you'll kill me if anyone tries to stop you, Howard. We'll be out of here in no time. They leave without waving goodbye. Go to page 46. <laughs> um, wait. <laughs> so you did the right thing and where did it get you? The townspeople hold the shortest trial in the history of the morning plan to hang you from the longest rope in the afternoon. Uh, yada yada, a thick rope around the neck like a turtleneck sweater, uh, last words look fire, mm-hmm. There he goes! That's a real arsonist! Oh, shoot! Uh, strong men drag the young arsonist down to jail. 
People ask if there's anything they could possibly do to make up for this terrible mistake that they made. You say yes, you've always wanted a permanent place in history. You would like it if they would rename this town after you. They refuse the end. <laughs> It's... Yeah, you know what? I'm gl I'm glad there are two different paths that get a player to here because it's a good page. It's a I good want page. People to see it. I'm with you. I'm with you. It's good. And uh, well, hey, that's like that's everything all the way back to getting on the horse the right way or wrong way. <laughs> that is that is all of the paths from there ex completely exhausted. So, I mean, we we got it. We got it. So we w. needed to make a. We needed to make a different decision earlier if we wanted to see the Baron at all. <laughs> if we wanted to see the freaking race part, but like, I mean, hey, I don't know. I wonder how much of the race was even in the book at this point. The, the only thing that I know is that there are up close pictures of the Baron true. like racing, and the art in the like the the in stream, oh, art, yeah. the in book art here is so good. That is, oh, that is true. Yeah. There's definitely race in here. Uh, we just didn't... <laughs> it's just not in our half of the book. <laughs> That's rude. We were on the outlaw path, not I've, the racing path. I gotta say, the arsonist outlaw uh, parent trap half of the book mm -hmm. is also really good, though. Mm -hmm. it, it hit us with some bangers. And I will be forever grateful for that. Uh... Huh. What, what, any, any closing thoughts on the old, on race into the past? I, I want to say that I really love the format for this one, but there's nothing especially unique about the format other than it's like a, something much more familiar to us from like a Goosebump story yeah. is there's an early diversion and then two complete different trees. Yeah. Like one of them is clearly about racing. One of them is clearly not at all about racing. Yeah, I think... Yeah, it seems like they maybe are moving closer towards like locking down what is going to be the format that turns mm -hmm. into give yourself self goosebumps here, which is it's interesting to see that it's kind of like unfold. It, it definitely is like it's getting closer to it. Uh though like the final the finality being that like the paths end up long like a bit longer. Uh mm -hmm. I it's really fun to just go through and basically see lots of like little fever dream snippets basically and mm -hmm. it, it is it's very fun for um my attention challenged mind these ones it does help in that way uh at the very least i uh, yeah uh i don't know i liked i liked the world of it there's there's something i feel like megan and h william stein have a very unique sense of humor in their writing that i mm -hmm. really gel with like this kind of sort of absurd Almost like they're kind of like negging you a bit. Yep. In a way, but like, but not overtly so. Like in, um, like in, oh, I was going to say Wizard's Quest, in Magic Shoot. Grail Quest. Grail Quest. Wizard's Quest and Magic Quest exist in uh, Wisconsin Dells, and they're wonderful. Well, Wizard's Quest is a wonderful little uh, tourist trap attraction in Wisconsin Dells <laughs> that lives rent free in my head. Uh, Grail Quest. It was very overtly negging the player in so many spots. Mm. Like, you ugly little pest. You would choose that, wouldn't you? Ding dong. You know, like mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Th this had like a little bit more of a, uh, like, I don't think about you at all. Kind of, uh, kind of snark instead mm -hmm. of the kind of like obvious at pointed snark, which I kind of, I, I liked. I like it a lot. I think it's good. Um, I, I, I just really, I, there are things that I've seen on other pages that we didn't reach, uh, as, as I'm tabbing through things and looking at the art, uh, that tells me that there is definitely a very, very consistent theming, uh, between the last Megan and H. William sign that we read, which was the formula. So that's the, the creation of the dog president, yeah. uh, and this one. A lot of subterfuge, a lot of, lot of, lot of governmental, like, sudden reveal. A lot of, like... Yeah. espionage yeah. A lot of American institution as well. Yeah. It's true. It's good. It's good. Uh, you know what else is good? Our oh. wonderful supporter for the episode, who is bleh, this person. Uh, do, you, do you mean Alex Dredd, the oh, executive producer yeah. of this episode of Turn to Page for season four, episode eight? How could I not? How could I mean anyone but 
Alex Dredge. Well, I'm glad that you do, because Alex Dredd is the executive producer of this episode. <laughs> Much appreciated, Alex Dredd, as well as to all of the other people who are helping with the production of the show over on patreon.com slash turn to page cast. Uh, the executive producers, of course, are picked from uh, the hardcover and above tiers, but much appreciated to each and all who give any support over there. Very kind. Yes. Thank you very much, Alex Dredd. Thank you, everybody else as well. As mentioned, patreon.com slash turn to page cast. It's a very, very helpful thing that makes this a lot more reasonable to conti like continue to do in an extended, uh, you know, capacity. Uh, also, you know, mentioning there's been some like some missed episodes due to uh ill and out of town and gone and stuff like that uh just to explain away what's going on with that there uh it should theoretically remain that way that's that was just some uh unfortunate lining up of a couple uh, unfortunate things mm -hmm. so, illness just, and misadventure yeah so that that's not intended to be a a regular thing just to to clear that up there uh but huge thank you to anybody who is supporting over there. If you want to help support in a free way, you can leave a little bit of a review on anywhere that you listen to the podcast. Uh, if you want to help out in another way, we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at turn to page cast. There is kind of a comment section over there on all of the video forms of these podcasts. If you want to have like a little bit of a, a little bit of a type at us. Or if you want to send an email, you can also go to turn to pagecast at gmail.com to shoot us something if you want to send us something more private. That is a way you can do that. But alas, alas, that is that. That's going to do it here for today for Turn to Page. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Adios.